Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, a Malmberg Manufacturing Company machine shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? There's hurry. There's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the edge here. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? From 1980 to 1982, the citizens of Minneapolis were subjected to terror by a cruel serial killer. Dubbed the Weepy-Voiced Killer, he earned his nickname by making high-pitched, mournful calls to the police after committing his murders. Paul Michael Stefani was the youngest of ten children raised in a Catholic household. At the age of three, his mother remarried, introducing him to a stepfather, who was notorious for physically abusing his stepchildren, often resorting to throwing them down the stairs. Paul later married Beverly Leiter and had a daughter with her, but their marriage ended in divorce. Despite holding various jobs, he faced termination from his janitorial position at Malberg Manufacturing Company in 1977. Coincidentally, the body of his first victim would be found near this very building. The initial target of this serial murderer was Karen Potak, a 20-year-old student at the University of Stevens Point. On the early hours of New Year's Day in 1980, while making her way home from a nightclub around 1 a.m., she fell victim to an assault by a man wielding a tire iron. The attack occurred on a street near Pierce Butler Road and Syndicate Avenue in St. Paul, Minneapolis, leaving her fighting for her life in the chilly winter air. At approximately 3 a.m., the assailant made a distressed call to the police, guiding them to the scene of the crime with trembling emotion, stating, there's a girl hurt here. Despite the severity of the assault, Karen miraculously survived albeit with no recollection of the incident. Unfortunately, the subsequent victim would not share her fortune. Oh, you, you find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself, I keep killing somebody. You know? On June 3rd, 1981, 18-year-old Kimberly Compton was brutally murdered, stabbed with an ice pick and strangled with a shoelace. Her lifeless body was stumbled upon by a group of teenage boys in a wooded area located north of Superior and Oneida Streets. Subsequent to Kimberly's tragic demise, law enforcement once more received a distressing phone call from her assailant. In a voice filled with anguish, he exclaimed, God damn, will you find me? I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Two days later, he made another call, expressing, I'll try not to kill anyone else. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe I think it's a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'd kill myself. I'd rather kill myself and get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. On August 5th, 1982, Barbara Simons, aged 40, met a tragic end, fatally stabbed with an ice pick. Her lifeless body was discovered by a newspaper carrier strolling along the Mississippi River near 29th Street. Once again, the perpetrator reached out to law enforcement, uttering, Please don't talk. Just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one over in St. Paul. Barbara was last seen at a local bar, where witnesses informed the police that she had accepted a ride home from a man described as approximately 40 years old, 6 feet tall, and weighing around 185 pounds. By your emergency. Please don't talk this lesson. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh my chief. I don't know what you're mad at me. I'm sick. I'm going to kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just going to. There's so many dogs with a red shirt on. It's me. I killed both of you. I'm sorry. I'm going to get the hell out of here. Calm down. Calm down. The last person to fall victim was Denise Williams, a 19-year-old sex worker from Minneapolis. Denise was soliciting on the streets when she encountered the still unidentified assailant. After negotiating a price for her services, Denise entered his vehicle, oblivious to the impending horror. As soon as the man diverted onto a dead-end street, 
Denise sensed trouble. Before she could even process the situation, the man attacked her with a screwdriver, stabbing her 15 times while she was confined to the passenger seat. Denise observed a glass bottle within reach and swiftly wielded it, shattering it across her assailant's face before making a desperate escape from the vehicle. Little did Denise realize at that moment, she had just narrowly survived an encounter with a serial killer, and this courageous act would ultimately lead to his capture. Following the failed attack, the assailant retreated to his residence before deciding to seek medical attention for the injuries sustained to his face. When he contacted the St. Paul Fire Department for assistance, authorities noticed striking similarities in his voice to that of the weepy-voiced killer. This pivotal realization swiftly led to the identification of the culprit as 37-year-old Paul Michael Stephanie. Paul was convicted for the murder of Barbara Simons, but insufficient evidence prevented convictions for the other killings. However, in 1997, Paul confessed to the murders of Kim Compton, Barbara Simons, and Kathy Greening, the latter killed in St. Paul on July 21, 1982. Paul's confession was prompted by his cancer diagnosis. He passed away at Oak Park's Height Maximum Security Prison on June 12, 1998. Thank you for delving on this journey through the shadows with us. If you're hungry for more tales of intrigue and suspense, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Together, we'll continue to unravel the enigmas that lurk in the shadows. Until next time, stay tuned, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth. This is the case of child killer Keith Nelson. On September 29, 1999, Keith Nelson approached James Robinson in the parking lot of A1 Staffing. A1 Staffing was a temporary work service in Kansas City, Kansas. He asked James if he wanted a job hauling cement out of a basement. He had never met James before. James agreed because he needed to earn some side money. And they left the A1 parking lot in Keith's white Ford F-150 pickup truck. After arriving at the job site, Keith began saying some very bizarre things to James. He told James that he would like to kidnap a woman and take her away from the city so he could torture, rape, electrocute, kill, and bury her. Keith Nelson revealed to James that he wanted to do this because he knew he was going back to prison for burglary and other petty crimes. He said if he was going to back to jail, he wanted to go back for something big. James acted cool about it, but this really tripped James out. He was going to report Keith to the police but changed his mind, deciding that Keith had to be messing with him. On October 2, 1999, Myshan Matson, a young medical student, was assaulted outside her apartment building. During the late hours of the night, Keith Nelson attacked her, brandishing a knife and threatening her life. Despite her struggles, he tried to forcibly move her from the apartment parking lot to his pickup truck. Throughout the ordeal, Keith continuously verbally abused Myshan, using derogatory language. Despite being handcuffed and threatened, Machine summoned her courage and managed to shout for assistance, although Keith covered her mouth with gloved hands. In a desperate move, Machine went limp and collapsed to the ground, allowing her to escape momentarily. As Keith fled the scene with Machine's purse, he issued menacing threats, warning her not to look at him or else face dire consequences. Despite her cries for help, Keith evaded capture, leaving Machine shaken but alive. Pamela Butler, a bright and intelligent fifth grade student at the age of 10, cherished attending school, adored her teacher, and cherished her friendships. Approximately one week following Michan's attempted abduction, Pamela returned home from school as usual. Later in the day, she went rollerblading to a nearby gas station to purchase some cookies and soda. Her sister Penny observed her departure. A short while later, Penny witnessed Pamela skating back home. As Pamela passed by a parked white Ford pickup truck with its door slightly open, a man emerged from the truck and forcefully seized Pamela, throwing her into the vehicle before speeding away, leaving Penny in a state of panic. Hearing Penny's screams, her older sister Casey rushed outside and witnessed the pickup truck driving off, with the man, later identified as Keith Nelson, making an obscene gesture towards them. The commotion caught the attention of Paul Wilt, who attempted to pursue Nelson's truck but ultimately lost sight of it. Nevertheless. Wilt managed to note down the truck's license plate number, 177CE2, and promptly contacted the authorities. Between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. on that same evening, Carl and Shirley Condra traveled to their church in Grain Valley, Missouri. Apart from attending services, the Condras also undertook custodial duties, 
cleaning the church during off hours. While at the church they noticed a white Ford pickup truck parked behind the building, which struck them as unusual since there shouldn't have been anyone present at that time. Unfamiliar with the truck and finding it unlocked with no one nearby or inside, they grew suspicious. Eventually, they resumed cleaning the church before returning home. Later that night, while watching the evening news, they heard about Pamela Butler's abduction and learned from the news report that the description matched the truck they had seen at the church. Realizing the significance, they promptly contacted the police, who investigated but found the truck had vanished. Meanwhile, after Pamela's abduction, Keith Nelson visited his mother Nancy's residence in Kansas City, Missouri. Together, they went to the Oasis Bar, located just a block and a half away from Pamela's home. Nancy patronized the bar while Keith engaged in playing video games. Following their time at the bar, they made a stop at the same gas station where Pamela had purchased her snacks, as Keith needed to buy cigarettes. Subsequently, Keith and his mother drove to Keith's girlfriend Kelly's residence, where the three of them watched news coverage regarding Pamela's kidnapping. According to Kelly, Keith displayed no signs of anxiety, remorse, grief, or any notable reaction to the news story. He appeared entirely composed. Later on, Keith and his mother returned home. At around 11 p.m., Patty Griffith, Nancy's neighbor, spotted Keith Nelson on the passenger side of the truck, wiping the dashboard. Periodically, Keith glanced up and down the street, checking for observers. By approximately 2 a.m., Keith drove off in his truck. Shortly afterward, he called for a cab to pick him up, being approximately 10 blocks away from his house. The dispatcher who handled the call recalled Keith's demeanor as very calm and even shared a joke, appearing to be in a good mood. Later that night, Patty was awoken by a noise and noticed Keith's truck was missing, and he was pacing in the yard. The following day, the police discovered his abandoned truck, completely cleaned out and left unlocked with the keys on the floorboard. Meanwhile, a massive manhunt had been initiated by the police to locate Keith Nelson and Pamela Butler. Two days after the abduction, on Thursday, Lori Torres, a civilian employee of the Kansas City Police Department, went to the Santa Fe rail yards to deliver lunch to her husband. During her journey, she took a detour and spotted Keith under the 18th Street Bridge, recognizing him from police photos. Apparently, Keith had attempted to lower himself from the bridge, but fell and became immobile. Lori promptly alerted the police, who concluded that the only way to extract Keith was via helicopter. While awaiting the helicopter team, a crowd gathered, and someone from the crowd questioned Keith about the girl's whereabouts. Keith responded, stating he knew but refused to disclose at that moment. Later that day, Keith was formally charged with the kidnapping of Pamela Butler and refused to cooperate with authorities in locating her. The subsequent day, law enforcement officials searched the woods and fields east of the church in which the Condras pronounced seeing Keith Nelson's truck. There, they made a demanding finding. They determined Pamela Butler's white sports activities bra and her underclothes. Not lengthy after they discovered the 10-year-old's nude, dead frame buried below a pile of brush, a twine become wrapped tightly round her throat, and post-mortem become conducted. The effects found out several scrapes, abrasions, and blunt pressure trauma to Pamela's mouth and head. She have been beaten. Her hymen have been torn close to the time of loss of life. Redness and infection have been found in her genital location indicating she had been raped. Pamela's respectable reason of loss of life becomes strangulation. Her underclothes become dispatched to the FBI for evaluation. With semen inside the crotch area, this matched with Keith Nelson's DNA. While awaiting trial, Keith Nelson remained incarcerated without bail. His unfortunate cellmate, Edward Frazier, recounted disturbing conversations he had with Keith. Keith would openly discuss his dark fantasies of kidnapping and inflicting torment upon women. He expressed his desire to construct a cell specifically designed to imprison women, detailing his twisted plan to stalk a potential victim for a week, meticulously monitoring her every movement before eventually abducting her. Once captured, he intended to confine his victims to a cell furnished solely with cotton for them to lie on denying them a bed and forbidding them from showering or even having access to toilet paper, leaving only a toilet as their sanitation option. Keith elaborated on his disturbing fantasies, expressing his intent to keep his victims restrained so he could subject them to his every whim. 
he callously described various positions and methods of sexual assault, emphasizing his desire to exert complete control over his victims. Ultimately, Keith callously revealed his intention to kill his victims once he had exhausted his sadistic desires. While he did not divulge the specifics of how he would carry out these murders to Edward, he did mention his plan to dispose of the bodies the old-fashioned way, hinting at dumping them in a river. Another unfortunate prisoner named Stephen, who had the cell was next door to Keith's cell, reported hearing disturbing sounds coming from Keith Nelson's cell. In March of 2000, at about 3 a.m., Stephen heard a voice coming from Keith's cell. He recognized the voice as Keith's. Stephen heard high-pitched, low-volume type screams that sounded like a little girl crying for mommy. These sounds were repeated multiple times during a 5 to 10 minute period. A few days later, while Stephen was awake reading in the middle of the night, he heard similar sounds coming from Keith's cell again. The sounds were a series of short, high-pitched screams. Stephen heard Keith talking in a little girl's voice, crying for her mommy and asking for help, begging to not be hurt or killed. The next day, Keith did it again. It was Keith reenacting the murder of Pamela to himself. The last time Keith did this, Stephen confronted him saying, How could you do that to that little girl? Keith replied, You wouldn't believe it. On October 25, 2001, a trial was convened, resulting in Keith Nelson being convicted of the murder of Pamela Butler and subsequently receiving a death sentence. In August of 2020, he was executed via lethal injection. Throughout the proceedings, and even until his execution, Keith Nelson exhibited no signs of remorse for his heinous crime. This is the case of Wesley Wayne Miller and the cheerleader attacks. In 1981, Susan Brown, a 17-year-old cheerleader at Castleberry High School in Lake Worth, Texas, was at home alone when she received a phone call at 6.50 p.m. The caller inquired about Ed, who was Susan's father. In those days, people could easily find names, addresses, and phone numbers in phone books. Susan informed the caller that her father wasn't present, and the caller promptly ended the call. Later, while Susan was talking to her sister on the phone, she heard the front door open and then close. Investigating the noise, she encountered a man at the door, shirtless, shoeless, and wearing ripped faded jeans with a nylon stocking covering his face. Terrified, Susan let out a blood-curdling scream. The guy ran towards and hit her so hard in the face that she fell to the ground. Next, he started ripping her cheerleader outfit off her. Susan managed to escape and ran through her kitchen into the dining room. Before she made it to the dining room, he cut her off and knocked her down again. Then he dragged her into the living room and behind the couch. There, he pulled her underwear down, exposing the maxi pad she was wearing as a result of her being on her period. At this point, Susan, being a girl of faith, began praying out loud. She prayed, Please God protect me. Please God don't let him make me pregnant. Please bring an angel and protect me. She repeated this while he tried to rape her, however, the man couldn't get an erection. As a result, he began rubbing her all over. Susan could tell this guy's penis was extremely small. Eventually, after repeated rubbing, he climaxed on top of her. Afterward, he told her to turn over and keep still as he walked out the door. After the man left, Susan ran and locked the door. She peeked out the front window and saw that the guy parked his car in front of a vacant lot down the street. She called the police. When the police arrived, she described her assailant's car as a dark Buick Regal. In addition, she told the police the man had a small penis and musky body odor. Susan described him as being Caucasian, 5 foot 8 inches to 5 foot 10 inches, and weighing around 140 pounds. The police had no suspects and no leads in the case, until he struck again 10 months later. On the morning of November 11, 1981, the Vosberg family in Saginaw, Texas, experienced a typical routine. Lynn Vosberg, 19 years old, remained at home while her parents and siblings departed for work and school before 8.15 a.m. Lynn had her own phone line and number in her bedroom, separate from the rest of the family. At approximately 8.20 a.m., her phone rang, and a man on the line inquired about a random name at their address. Lynn denied any such person lived there and promptly ended the call. Shortly after the family phone rang, with the same man asking about a different individual, to which Lynn provided the same response. Eventually, Lynn drifted back to sleep. 
She was abruptly awakened by a man wearing a white athletic shirt and a nylon mask covering his face, kneeling beside her bed. He gripped her phone cord, attempting to disconnect it from the wall. In shock, Lin demanded to know his intentions, to which he menacingly replied, I'm fixing to fuck you, before pushing her and issuing threats, unless she complied with his demands to undress. Despite her pleas, the assailant forcibly stripped her clothes off, making lewd remarks and subjecting her to unwanted sexual acts. Notably, he displayed a small penis and engaged in derogatory behavior, spitting on her when she refused his advances. Subduing Lin on the bed, the attacker confessed to stalking her and inquired about her sexual history, warning her not to disclose the assault under threat of further harm. After he finished, he instructed her to remain still as he exited through the sliding patio door. Lin immediately sought refuge in her parents' room, locking the door and contacting the police to report the assault. Unfortunately, despite her report, the police were unable to apprehend the perpetrator. Less than a month later, on December 7th at 11.15 a.m. in River Oaks, Texas, 18-year-old Lisa Ticknor decided to sleep in after working late the previous night. She lived with her mother, who suffered from a degenerative disease that impaired her mobility and caused episodes of confusion and disorientation. On that particular morning, Lisa's mother was in her usual spot in the den, with their housekeeper out running an errand. As Lisa slept, an intruder entered the house through the carport, wearing a red mask with a nylon covering. Startled awake, Lisa saw the man run and then leap onto her bed. Initially mistaking it for a sick prank by a friend, Lisa soon realized the seriousness of the situation as the man began strangling her. Subduing her, he forcibly exposed her breasts and underwear by opening her bathrobe. Although he began removing her underwear, he abruptly stopped and, in a hushed tone, instructed Lisa to do so herself, promising not to harm her mother if she complied. Partially unveiling his face, he proceeded to lick her breasts while attempting to rape her, despite struggling with a small penis and difficulty achieving an erection. Eventually succeeding in the assault, he ordered Lisa to roll over, threatening her mother's safety if she resisted. After the assailant left, Lisa quickly rose and saw him on the other side of their fence in the neighbor's yard, before rushing to her mother in the den. Concealing the true nature of the attack, she attributed it to a prank by a friend, unable to burden her mother with the grim reality. After reassuring her mother and arranging for a friend to contact a police officer acquaintance, Lisa went to the hospital for a rape examination. The very next day, at around 11 a.m., 20-year-old Selena McDonald took a shower in her home, which was located not far from Lynn's residence. After finishing her shower, Selena dressed in her bra and underwear before proceeding to her closet to select some clothes. As she opened the closet door, a man suddenly emerged and attacked her. He wore only a t-shirt and emitted a strong odor of stale body odor. Subsequently, the assailant dragged Selena across the floor to her bed and proceeded to restrain her with medical tape. He then proceeded to rape her before binding her further and departing. Merely a month later, the rapist struck again, this time targeting Deborah Orman at a laundromat in Sansom Park, Texas. While she was retrieving her clean clothes to her car, Deborah noticed a man at a payphone observing her. Upon returning inside the laundromat, the man assaulted her, forcing her to the floor and dragging her to the back sink area. There, he forcibly removed her clothing and raped her, while assuring her safety if she remained compliant. Subsequently, he attempted to use a 20-inch stick and the cap of a bleach bottle in an unsuccessful attempt to further assault her. Eventually, he ordered her to lie face down until he departed. Despite the horrific nature of Lisa, Deborah, Selena, Lynn, and Susan's assaults, they were considered fortunate compared to other victims. One week after Deborah's assault, a young woman named Amy returned to her apartment around 6 p.m. and noticed the front door slightly ajar. Despite expecting her roommate, Raitha Stratton, to be home, there were no lights on inside. Raitha, a cheerleader at Castleberry High School, was nowhere to be found. Upon entering the apartment and switching on a light, Amy discovered blood splattered on the wall. Alarmed, she rushed to her sister's apartment next door for assistance. Together they returned to Amy's apartment and observed blood streaks across the living room floor, leading into Raitha's bedroom. Inside, they found Raitha lying nude on her back with her legs spread positioned at the entrance of her closet door. A knife remained lodged in her chest, and her underwear was stuffed in her mouth. 
Raytha had sustained 38 stab wounds and cuts, including four directly to her heart and 11 to her neck. FBI profiler John Douglas was consulted to develop a profile for the perpetrator. He suspected that the assailant was unable to achieve an erection, and the use of the knife symbolized sexual penetration. Shortly after Raytha's tragic murder, 18-year-old Wesley Miller, the captain of Castleberry High School's football team, visited his girlfriend's house and requested to use the bathroom. He appeared with blood on him, which he claimed was from being struck with a football. After cleaning up, he departed. Later that evening, upon learning of Raytha's death, his girlfriend contacted the police. Authorities visited Wesley's residence and brought him in for questioning. Eventually, he admitted to going to Raytha's house with the intention of engaging in sexual activity. Initially, he alleged that Raytha initially consented, but then rebuffed him. In a fit of anger, he fatally stabbed her and concealed her body in the closet. Wesley Miller pleaded guilty to Raytha Stratton's murder and received a 25-year prison sentence. Subsequently, he was civilly committed under the state's Sexually Violent Predator Program, ensuring his indefinite incarceration.